At the beginning of the 4th century AD, the Roman Empire faced one of the biggest crises in its history. It was now so huge that it had been carved up between four emperors, two in the west and two in the east. Like rats in a sack, they scrabbled for power. One man would try to unite the empire. One empire, one god, one emperor! The world will know the name of Constantine. Constantine would change the face of the empire and leave the greatest legacy of any of Rome's emperors. A new world religion. The army of Rome marches in the name of the one true God! Christianity. Can you give me a sense of what it's like to be in the presence of Pope Francis? I think he uh, projects the kind of humility uh, and kindness that is consistent with my understanding, at least, of, of Jesus' teachings. My understanding, at least, of, of Jesus' teachings and his uh, belief uh, in in the power of uh, the spiritual over the material uh, uh, reflects itself in, in uh, everything that uh, he, he says and does. and with all we give thanks to the extraordinary sacrifice uh, of Jesus Christ our Savior. Reflect on the brutal pain that he suffered, the scorn that he absorbed, the sins that he bore, this extraordinary gift uh, of salvation that he gave to us. And we try as best we can to comprehend the darkness that he endured so that we might receive God's light. The resurrection of Christ is our strength, our greatest certainty. It is the most precious treasure. And it is not only for us, it is to pass it on and share it with others. These were some of the words of Pope Francis Wednesday morning in St. Peter's Square in the second general audience of his pontificate, attended by some 50,000 faithful. Speaking of the resurrection of Christ, the Pope recalled that even among believers themselves sometimes have crept doubts about what is the center of the Christian message. But it is the resurrection that opens our lives to the full happiness, the certainty that evil, sin, and death can be defeated. And this leads us to face everyday realities with courage and commitment. In his homily, the Pope explained that the key to Christian faith is found in the death and resurrection of Jesus. Of course, uh, we recognize that there's a lot of pain and a lot of sin and a lot of tragedy in this world, but we're also overwhelmed by the grace of an awesome God. We're reminded how he loves us so deeply that he gave his only begotten son so that we might live through him. And in these holy days, we recall all that Jesus endured for us, the scorn of the crowds and the pain of the crucifixion uh, in our Christian religious tradition. Uh, we celebrate the glory of the resurrection, also that we might be forgiven of our sins and granted everlasting life. 
The church's message, the Pope writes, has to concentrate on the essentials, on what is most beautiful, most grand, most appealing, and at the same time, most necessary. With the essentials, what shines forth is the beauty of the saving love of God made manifest in Jesus Christ, who died and rose from the dead. Inspired by Jesus' poverty and concerned for the impoverished, Pope Francis calls for a church which is poor and for the poor. I'm reading verbatim from the Catholic Vatican website. Justification means that Christ himself is our righteousness, in which we share through the Holy Spirit in accord with the will of the Father. To, together we Catholics and Protestants, Lutherans, believe and confess that by grace alone, in faith in Christ's saving works, and not because of any merit on our part, we are accepted by God and receive the Holy Spirit who renews our hearts while equipping and calling us to good works. If you are the Son of God, Yet only when we come to understand in the light of the cross the evil we are capable of and have even been a part of, can we experience true remorse and true repentance. In his Tuesday morning Mass, Pope Francis talked about repentance. He said that only those who truly repent accept salvation. He went even further explaining what it really means to reject one's sins. Se tu non ascolta il Signore, non accetta la correzione e non confida in Lui, tu hai un cuore non pentito. He then added that Jesus condemned the hypocrites who call themselves pure but lived a double life. There is a tendency in us, a sinful tendency, that can pervert and distort our faith. Stop doing evil or prepare for hell. That was the message from Pope Francis. During his Tuesday morning Mass, Pope Francis talked about prayer. He said that reading the Gospel every day helps Christians change their lives for the better. E noi dobbiamo dirci, peccatori sì, tutti qui, eh? Tutti siamo. Corrotti no. However, Pope Francis warned there is a difference between being a sinner and being corrupt. Those who sin and repent, who ask for forgiveness, are humble before the Lord. But those who continue to sin while pretending to be Christian lead a double life. They are corrupt. And where there is deceit, the Spirit of God cannot be. We should all call ourselves sinners, Pope Francis said, but those who are corrupt do not understand humility. Jesus called them whitewashed tombs. They appear beautiful from the outside, but inside they are full of dead bones and corruption. Repentance is the activity of reviewing one's actions and feeling remorse for past wrongs. Repentance includes an admission of guilt, resolve not to repeat the offense, and an attempt to make restitution or to reverse the course of action. Repentance is a change of mind that involves a conscious turning away from wrong actions, attitudes, and thoughts that conflict with the godly lifestyle and biblical commands, and an intentional turning toward doing that which the Bible says pleases God. And a Christian who boasts about being Christian but does not lead a Christian life is corrupt. We all know such people, Pope Francis said, and they damage the church because they don't live in the spirit of the gospel, but in the spirit of worldliness. 
In his homily at Casa Santa Marta, Pope Francis spoke on lukewarm Christians. He explained that they are people who look like Christians, but in reality are worldly and mediocre. Sono nemici della croce di Cristo. Prendono il nome, ma non seguono le esigenze della vita cristiana. During his Tuesday morning Mass, Pope Francis talked about Christian life. He explained that being Christian is simple, even though at times it may seem complicated. These are the two conditions. To follow Jesus. To listen to the Word of God and put it in practice. This is the Christian life. Nothing more. Simple, simple. Forse noi l'abbiamo fatta un po' difficile, con tante spiegazioni che nessuno capisce. Ma la vita cristiana è così, è sì. ascoltare la parola di Dio e praticarla. We see faith driving us to do right. There are many hidden saints, men, women, fathers and mothers of families, sick people, priests, who every day put into practice the love of Jesus. And this gives us hope. That was the message of Pope Francis on Thursday at his daily morning mass at Casa Santa Marta. The true Christian, he said, puts the word of God into practice. It is not enough simply to say that you have faith. Commenting on the parable of the house built on rock or on sand taken from the day's gospel, Pope Francis said we should not be Christians in appearance only. It is not enough to simply belong to a good Catholic family or to an association or to be a benefactor if we don't follow God's will. So many Christians in appearance collapse at the first temptation, the Pope said, because there's no substance there they've built on the sand. On the other hand, there are many saints among the people of God, not necessarily canonized saints, but saints nonetheless, who put the love of Jesus into practice. They build their houses on the rock, which is Christ. What are your values? What do you care about? What's important to you? What do you respect? What do you value? What satisfies you? And then work to align your behavior to what you say you care about. Have the church's broader mission of helping the whole world to hear and live the universal call to holiness. In his Monday morning Mass, Pope Francis talked about the gift of faith. He explained that Christians are called to protect faith and to reflect on how to best live it out on a day-to-day -day basis. Se noi non abbiamo questa cura ogni giorno di ravvivare questo regalo di Dio che è la fede, ma la fede si indebolisce, si anacqua, si finisce per essere una cultura. Sì, ah, sì, sì, sono cristiano, sì, sì, una cultura soltanto. Ma come tu vivi la tua fede? E questa è l'importanza di ravvivare ogni giorno questo tono, questo regalo, di farlo vivo. We see faith driving us to do right. Oh. Faccio la doppia faccia. Mi faccio il cattolico, mi vicino alla chiesa, poi vivo come un pagano. What the Lord wants from us is to announce this reconciliation, which is his own core message. The Holy Father concluded, Christian life is not a spa therapy that helps us to be at peace until heaven but it calls us to go out into the world to proclaim that Jesus became the sinner to reconcile men with the Father. It's always a case of mission. We go along Jesus' path to do something. It's not like a show going along Jesus' path. We are following behind him to do something. This is our mission. The Lord sends us out to proclaim the risen Christ with joy. 
Pope Francis made a strong call to witness in word and deed at Mass Sunday evening in his first visit to the Basilica of St. Paul outside the walls. You cannot proclaim the gospel of Jesus, the Pope said, without concrete proof of life. Who hears and sees us must be able to read in our actions what they hear from our mouth and give glory to God. Uh, as brothers and sisters in Christ, we're never tired of doing good. Stilo de vita della fede. E padre, cosa devo fare questo? Ma chiedere al Signore chi ti aiuti a fare cose buone, ma con fede. Ma... Keep us at tasks too hard for us that we may be driven to thee for strength. I've wondered at times if maybe God was answering that prayer a little too literally. But no matter the challenge, he has been there for all of us. He has certainly strengthened me with the power through his spirit as I've sought his guidance, not just in my own life, but in the life of our nation. Stop copying me! Dude, this is kind of freaking me out. Okay, you stop talking and I'll say something. Say something. No, you don't talk, I will. No, you, you don't talk, God! Okay, seriously, what the f I got it. Say something completely random. Ready? One, two, three, Bananarama, what the f Isn't that how Jesus lived? Isn't that how he loved? Embracing those who were different, serving the marginalized, humbling himself to the last. This is the example that we are called to follow. To love him with all our hearts and mind and soul and to love our neighbors, and all our neighbors, as ourselves. As it says in the first letter of John, let us not love with words or speech, but with actions and in truth. God, our spirit's eternal God, that we may never forget that the highest appreciation is not to utter words, but to become a model of what we advocate. As we pray and ask in your holy name, amen. Camminiamo nel mondo come Gesù e facciamo di tutta la nostra esistenza un segno del suo amore per i nostri fratelli, specialmente i più deboli e i più poveri. Noi costruiamo a Dio un tempio nella nostra vita. And more than 2,000 years later, it inspires us still. We are drawn to his timeless teachings, challenged to be worthy of his sacrifice, to emulate as best we can his eternal example, to love one another just as he loves us. And of course, we're always reminded each and every day that we fall short of that example. And none of us are free from sin, but we can look to his life and strive knowing that if we love one another, God lives in us and his love is perfected in us. Pope Francis spent part of Holy Thursday in a prison in Rome. The pontiff washed the feet of 12 male and female inmates and a baby as he marked the start of Easter weekend in the Italian capital. Meant to show his willingness to serve, Francis reenacted the ritual said to have been carried out by Jesus before he was crucified. Now, some of it's his words, his message of justice and inclusion, especially for the poor uh, and the outcast. He implores us to see the inherent dignity in each human being. Um, but it's also his deeds, simple yet profound. Hugging the homeless man, and washing the feet of somebody who Normally, ordinary folks would just pass by on the street. Uh, he reminds us that all of us, no matter what our station, have uh, an obligation to live righteously and that we all have an obligation to live humbly because um, that's, in fact, the example that we profess to follow. You bring fire. You bring fire. 
not to destroy, but to purify. You bring an earthquake, not to shatter, but to awaken. You bring weapons, not to kill, but to assure, to encourage. Indeed, you are Peter, the rock upon which Jesus builds his church. You have a, a, a Pope who sustains and maintains um, what I consider the central message of, uh, of the gospel. We treat everybody uh, as children of God and that uh, we love them uh, the way Jesus Christ taught us to love them. Today, our family will join millions across the country in celebrating the birth of Jesus. The birth not just of a baby in a manger, but the message that has changed the world. To reach out to the sick, the hungry, the troubled, and above all else, to love one another as we would be loved ourselves. We hope that this holiday season will be a chance for us to live out that message, to bridge our differences and lift up our family, friends, and neighbors, and to reconnect with the values that bind us together. His Holiness expresses that basic law. Treat thy neighbor as yourself. Semplice, due regole. Ama Dio soprattutto e ama l'altro perché il tuo fratello è la tua sorella. E con queste due cose andiamo avanti. And finally, uh, let's remember that if there is one law that we can all be most certain of that seems to bind people of all faiths and, and people who are still finding their way towards faith, but have a sense of ethics and morality in them, that one law, that golden rule, that we should treat one another as we wish to be treated. And the Torah says, love thy neighbor as yourself. In Islam, there's a hadith that states, none of you truly believes until he loves for his brother what he loves for himself. The Holy Bible tells us to put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. Put on love. Whatever our beliefs, whatever our traditions, we must seek to be instruments of peace and bringing light where there is darkness and sowing love where there is hatred. And this is the loving message of His Holiness, Pope Francis. We are created children in the likeness of God, and the blood of Christ has redeemed us all. Pope Francis said this means we all have the duty to do good. This commandment for everyone to do good, he said, is a beautiful path towards peace. If we, each doing our own part, do good to others, then slowly, gently, little by little, we can build that culture of encounter which we need so much. We must meet one another doing good. Christ's resurrection, he writes, is not an event of the past. It contains a vital power which has permeated this world. And he adds, Jesus did not rise in vain. May we never remain on the sidelines of this march of living hope. So this morning, uh, my main message is just to say thank you to all of you, because you don't remain on the sidelines. Uh, I want to thank you for your ministries, for your good works, uh, for the marching you do for justice and dignity and inclusion, uh, for the ministries that all of you uh, attend to and have helped organize throughout your communities each and every day to feed the hungry. And How's the homeless? Before I explain the heresy that really is laid in everything that Obama and Pope Francis say, 
I would like to preach you the gospel because you can't discern the false gospel unless you believe the true gospel. Because there's a vast difference between the two, and it's apparent in everything that Pope Francis and Obama say. Every man is separated from God by their sins because God is completely perfect, but man's works are all evil. So God sent his own son Jesus to take the place of all our sins to reconcile us with God as the mediator between us and God. For the gospel is that God sent his own son Christ to take the place of all our works. And because all our works were sin, Christ had to die on the cross for the wages of sin is death. But God raised Jesus from the dead to testify that he has accepted Christ as the perfect sacrifice, the perfect substitute, the perfect propitiation for all the works, for all the sins of the world. So the core, the foundation of the gospel is that God has provided the good works by offering his son Jesus to be the good works of everyone who believes in him. It was imperative that God provide Christ to be our good works because on judgment day, God will judge every man according to his works. And if any man's works are sin, they will be cast into the lake of fire along with the devil and all the angels who sin. But if you believe the gospel, Jesus himself is your good works. So when God judges every man according to his works, your works will justify you because Christ your works will testify that you are his. So the good news is that we are one with Christ. He is our good works. We are his good works. He is our righteousness. We are his righteousness. So on judgment day, Jesus will testify that we are his because he cannot deny himself. So the good news of the gospel is that Jesus Christ is our good works. All the clips that I played with Obama and Pope Francis contained very deep heresies. Most people are unable to distinguish or discern these heresies uh, because they don't know the foundation upon which they're built upon. And that really goes back to the definition of good works. The way you define good works reveals who you worship. You see, the Bible says only God is good. So whatever you believe is good is your God. If you think your own works, your own deeds, no matter how good they appear, if you think that your own works are good, then your works are your idol. They're your God and they're in place of Christ. You see in the All Under One Christ joint agreement that's been signed between the Vatican and a vast majority of Christian cults and believed upon by 99% of Christians, uh, they began by identifying that we are saved by Christ's saving work, that Christ himself is our righteousness, our good works. But then we see that there's a departing, there's a redefining of good works, and the statement of faith ends by claiming that we're called to do other good works. So we are saved by Christ's good works, that we are saved by Christ, who is our good works, but then we're called to do other good works. And so you see that there's an addition of leaven, that leaven that destroys the entire lump. There's a redefining of good works. And the Bible says that those who have believed upon Christ should be very careful to maintain good works, because every man's gonna be judged according to their works. Your works are the most critical element. Your faith is useless, your faith is dead alone. The Bible makes that clear that faith alone is demonic, you know, even demons believe. But it's your works that determine whether or not you are a true believer, whether you're a true son of God. And so the devil has always been trying to redefine good works. And the Bible says that uh, before the man of sin can be revealed, there should be a great falling away first. Now we are in the midst of that right now, as the devil has already redefined good works and in so doing, he has, he has laid the groundwork for the Antichrist who's going to be on the scene preaching, yeah, believe in Christ, but do these good works. And these good works that they're teaching that you should do are actually the works of the devil. Now the works that Pope Francis preaches and that Obama preaches, uh, they include, I made a list of them, uh, if you look at any of uh, the clips that I watched, the good works of Pope Francis and Obama are repentance from sin, striving to do good by practicing the word of God, feeding the hungry, keeping the commandments, caring for the poor, uh, housing the homeless, preaching the gospel, loving your neighbors, and seeking peace with all men. But they do the works of their father the devil. These are the works of the devil. It's actually made clear that many will come to Jesus in the last day and say, Lord, Lord, in your name we evangelize, we prophesy, in other words, in your name we cast out demons, in your name we fed the hungry and how's the homeless and we did all these good works for you and you see that Jesus replies to them and he says depart from me I never knew you doers of sin so clearly in God's eyes all of these works are sin they are not truly good works 
like people have deceived themselves into believing. And so it has always been the goal of the devil in order to deceive people into turning that which is evil into good, into viewing that which is filthy rags as good, so that men would be uh, deceived into pursuing after evil. And that's what we see here. You see, uh, it doesn't matter to Obama or to the devil if you claim to believe in Jesus. The question is, what are your works? If you really believe in Jesus, that means Christ himself is your good works. And you have no other works. Christ, that's it. He's your works. You don't need any other works for any reason. Not for reward, not for sanctification, not for glorification, not for uh, whatever uh, justification men come up with. From beginning to end, Christ is all of our works plus nothing. But the devil is always trying to add those works. And he's going to claim they're good works. But nonetheless, if you add those works to your faith, your faith is demonic. It's dead. And the Bible says that God has redeemed unto himself a people that are very zealous for good works. Now let me ask you, uh, were the Pharisees zealous for good works? Indeed, they were very zealous for helping people and uh, tithing. And, uh, and they would even tell people that you can tithe all your, uh, instead of giving to your parents, give all that money to the church. And they were very zealous for doing these things that they thought were good works. But they were the people who were going to come to Christ in the last day and say, you know, in your name we did all these good works. And he's going to say to them, depart from me, doers of sin, because that's not the true good works. God is redeemed for himself a people that are zealous for good works, that are zealous for Christ, that are passionate about Christ, because he is our good works. The Bible says that we are thoroughly equipped with all good works. The moment you believe upon Christ, you're furnished. You've been fully equipped with all good works, period. You don't need any more good works because you've received Christ in place of all of your works. See, Christ is your good works. I want to thank you for your ministries, for your good works. Uh... The prophet Elijah once said, If the Lord is God, worship the Lord. But if Baal is God, then worship Baal. I tell you the same thing. If you believe that the works that God provided on the cross when he gave up his own son Jesus Christ are good works, well then receive Jesus Christ as your good works so that you may be lacking absolutely nothing. But if you believe that your own works are good, the deeds that you do with your dead flesh, well, then continue worshiping the devil, because only the devil receives sin. Because if your works are anything less than perfect, they are sin, for that is the very definition of sin. And the devil is the father of all sin, and he is the one who glories in your dead works.